I was never really black to begin with. I've never really displayed traits of a black man, behaved as one, or have evidence to prove my race verification. I'm an imposter. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I'm thinking what you're thinking. <laughs> but growing up, my race was questioned and confused by others, which made me question myself. And maybe it was because of my surroundings. Growing up, most of my friends were Asian, so my race, my race must have changed. As my middle school science teacher, my friends and I were deemed the Asian persuasion, despite there being a clear discrepancy in that statement. <laughs> or as my cousins, I told them I hadn't seen a black classic and my friends have been putting me on anime lately. They all replied, one day you'll be black. <laughs> one day I will, <laughs> and that day was soon. The affirmation of my blackness had met its day a prime chance to verify what has been questioned for years and counting. It was a trip to a safe haven for all black people, a utopia where we're all the same and uplift one another in power. This was a college trip tour to a visit HBCUs, historically black colleges. The year is 2018, high school, junior year. My mom has been telling me for weeks I needed this, the true black man experience, she says, as if I'm not living it. On this tour, I'm told I can connect with my people, create brother and sisterhood, and develop into, an, into a black man. Plus, I would be going with black kids from all over California, kids just like me, so I wouldn't be alone. The trip coordinator is first the same with a thorough message of community and black acceptance. It was an elite pitch, and I was sold. I mean, as time passed, I began to slowly but surely romanticize the trip. I imagined the, the idea of creating a community of people just like me the idea of being black, the idea of the true black man experience. Oh, so lovely. Imagine me becoming a tall, did I say tall? Tall, handsome, charming, <laughs> empowered, <laughs> black man. <laughs> it was crazy to believe, but I was determined to have it as my reality. <laughs> it's October, the day of the trip. I and about 35 black kids from California are in LAX airport waiting to depart. I'm still with my parents waiting to get ready to pa go past security. My mom promised me, go make some friends, and that I didn't need to stay by her hip. I know I didn't, but I was never one to go out my way to talk, let alone something just didn't feel right. As I look at these kids, I know we're supposed to be the same, but I can't, I can't help but feel different. I looked at them and comparison consumes my mind. The way I spoke, dress, Looked, did it align, did it fit? Anxiety shot through my body and I felt a deep sense of fear. A lot of them are chatting and laughing as I watch from a distance. Most of these kids' energy put shouts of belonging while mine whispered for acceptance. No amount of physical similarity could reassure the feelings I was having. I felt froze. I tried reasoning with myself, but by that time, we started the flying process. As we go through security, I'm in line with the kids to get screened. All the kids were chatting amongst themselves through the screening, but I had yet to be spoken to or approached by any of them. The feeling of alienation was charging with each passing second. I was becoming a mental and insecure wreck. I was expecting inclusivity. I was convinced of such. The coordinators of the trip pitch was black community and empowerment, yet they hadn't batted an eye. But maybe it was me. What had I done to put myself out there? Nothing. So I took it upon myself to interact with some of the kids. As I put my shoes on from the security scan, I saw three kids huddled up that I wanted to approach. I lock my targets in and prepare Oscar-worthy lines in my head for what I'm going to speak to them. As I begin my approach, the confidence I built speaks, leaks through my aura, but I proceed knowing I needed to try, at least for my sanity. I said hello and immediately was off-put. Their gaze their gaze. It was one I was all too familiar with. Their eyes sent the message of unfamiliarity and disinterest that I received very clearly. As I speak to them, I feel my words going through them. I ask for their names, where they're from, and why they're here, but their body told me all I needed to know. They just answered my questions, nodding and smiling, trying to sell it for conversation, but I wasn't buying it. I walk away and reflect. Some brotherhood, huh? I think, masking my pain with a stone cold expression and aura. But how could I not? How can I ignore this feeling of hurt and alienation consuming me inside? The kids just stared at me as if I was confused, and I, and I was. 
Confused till if I was on the right trip. I must have went the wrong way. Why has no one connected with me? Do I smell? Am I ugly? What could it be? My thoughts run and run all the way till we get on the flight. Nothing soothes them, but I convince myself it's first day vibes. Uh, I'm bound to make friends, right? We haven't even gone to the HBCUs. I'm, I'm being unreasonable. I reassure myself. I reassure myself. I belong. But did I really? We arrived in Atlanta, Georgia at 7 a.m. Our first stop is Morehouse, the most famous HBCUs of them all. As we arrive at the college, I'm in awe. The atmosphere, the vibes, the people, were everything they mentioned. A Morehouse man, the brand of the college, and I saw it through each passing individual. It was brothers walking side by side in their aura exuding excellence, students mel melanin glistening from the sun rays, people empowered in their blackness. It was a haven of black people projecting a certain class. It felt so real. Do I belong? The thought immediately popped into my head. My eyes overwhelmed and heavy at the sight I was shown. My insecurities were screaming. My image and my blackness were being challenged with each black king I saw. There were so many of them, but I hadn't seen any. As we head back to the bus, I'm near the last of the line. I end up sitting in the very back, but there awaiting me was Kobe. No, not Kobe Bryant. This Kobe lacked athletic ability, but Kobe, my soul friend on the trip. How did I miss running into this kid with this outdated flat top? But I related to because I had the same style and it wasn't the norm. If you put us side by side, we had about 90% similarity, like looking into a mirror, and I was so happy to find it. Brotherhood. In the midst of getting to know Kobe, I asked, have you made friends with anyone on this trip? Not really, he replied. No one has really tried talking to me like that. Same, Kobe, same. I proceeded to look down the walkway of the bus and then outside to the window. Trees filled the scene from the other side. I felt gratitude to have met someone. A calm touched my soul. The truth of the situation was clear. Outsiders. As we finished our visits for the day, we arrived at the hotel. One of the coordinators came across to me and said, Isaiah, you're rooming with Kobe. Woo! We good, I thought. I got the room with my only friend. This trip was finally turning tides. And you two will also be rooming with A and K. You've got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> A&K. A&K of all people. This isn't real life. A&K were the two most popular kids on the trip. From the moment we arrived, I knew they were the main characters. Was it their smile, their aura, their riz? Who knows? But what I did know is that they held the keys to each door and was treated as such. When I was told I was rooming with them, my eyes bulged. How could the two most alienated kids on the trip be partnered with the two most popular kids? It's like pizza dipped in ranch. Who thought of it? Whose idea was it? Who's in charge? <laughs> I look across at A and K, and they aren't thrilled either. Their body language speaks confusion, but hey, at least it gave our partnership some similarity. After all, I also knew it was a bad marriage. When we got to our rooms, we delegated who's sleeping where and where our spaces were. We then settled in, but the division in the room was already awaiting us. No one spoke. An unspoken border was instilled, and not even the simulator of our skin could bring this room together. What a shame. As I was getting ready for bed, brushing my teeth, I overheard a conversation Kay was having on the phone with another kid from the trip. Yeah, man, one of these nights, everyone from the trip should leave their rooms and meet up, Kay says. I'm with it, the other replies. They were planning a meetup for all kids on the trip in our hotel room. I was secretly excited for it. Part of me thought it would be a way to connect and prove my place on the trip, but I also had felt reasonable doubts. I pondered on the idea, but fell asleep with the idea heavy on my eyelids. In the following days, the more colleges were visited, memories were made, but the dynamic of the trip remained the same. Outside looking in. And today was the day of the room hangout. When we got to the room, I was already pretty tired. I wasn't necessarily enthused to have everyone bombard the room. We had just visited three colleges throughout the day, nonstop in southern humid weather. Yuck. If you know, you know. I just wanted to be held by the grace of my bed at this point. It was now 11, and no one had come. I thought maybe the idea had got canceled and plans with sleep were now imminent. Kobe was already asleep, and I began to do the same. As I lay in my area, <laughs> K&A rushed to the open the door, and there awaits a mob of the kids. I'm in pajamas and feel utterly exposed. 
I was not expecting them to go through with it. Kobe wakes up in shock, and drool is dripping from his, from his face. It's a whole party now. Everyone is spread out in every area of the small room, chatting, laughing, joking, having a good time. I find myself in the middle of the room, sitting on the floor. I'm involved in some of the conversations being had, but it didn't feel that way. I look over to Kobe, but he's in the corner trying to act sleep. I can't rely on him for community at this moment. After a while, I give up on my attempts to be involved. I stare directly at the TV. Lakers versus Rockets. I remember so distinctly. I stare vacuously at the screen, playing the role of interest for a game I care nothing about. My body present, but my mind and soul excuse themselves from the room. The kids' voices echo through my energy, but I'm far away. Far away from them, home, myself. The alienation and unbelonging finalize at this moment. I didn't belong, and I didn't want to. I look down at my phone and see a text from my girlfriend at the time. As I reply, a girl from the trip approaches me and asks, ooh, who you texting? I look up in a daze and I was forming, as I was forming my number one selling sad book in my head. My girlfriend, uh, I reply, confused. I didn't know you had a girlfriend, she says. How was she ever going to know when no one had even taken the time to get to know me? What was she expecting? My life story to be on my clothes? She then proceeded to ask more questions about me and we conversed. This then leads to me talking to more people through her and finally be acknowledged by some of the kids and having a good night. Isn't it crazy that through all of this, it took one person taking the time to get to know me to change the ties, to feel understood, to feel seen, a feeling we crave but deny from ourselves because of our experiences. But do you see yourself? I didn't, and I looked outside of to validate what was within. A costly decision, but one that came with good value because I never lacked black, and I was always deserving to be seen for who I am, but by myself more than anything. Thank you. Zay Lester, everybody.